Okay, it's recording. Yes, it's great. Hello and welcome everybody. This is the April artist demonstration of the Society of West Coast Artists. My name is Jim Stinger and I am the president of the San Francisco chapter of SWA. We are delighted to have Joseph Altward be our demo, demo artist today. And he is going to demo for us a still life. And I'm very looking forward to that. And I'm going to turn it over to him and let him tell you a little bit about himself. Okay, thank you. So take it away, Joe. Will do. Okay, so my name is Joe Alter. Um, I grew up here in Halfham Bay where we have our studio with my, my wife, Ina. And I. She'll also be doing a demo next month too on portraiture, I think. So check that one out. Um, I started painting when I went to junior college um, with one of the people that are on the screen there. I won't name any names. Um, and so I studied at CSM for about a year and a half, two years. Uh, and then I ended up going to Florence, Italy and studying at the Florence Academy uh, for four years and I ended up living there for six. Um, so most of my training uh, was there. It was pretty good. Just wake up in the morning and draw and paint all day long until you can't stand up and did that for four years straight. Um, after that, I kind of moved around a bit and ended up in Barcelona. And that's where I've been for the last five years or so, teaching at a school there. Uh, and now my wife and I just moved back over here to the coast. And that's about it. So um, today <clears throat> we'll be working in the studio here. Um, I try to use natural light if I can. We also have artificial lights here. Um, but the quality of light that you get with natural light, I, I like a lot more than the artificial light. So um, you might see some kind of um, reflections of cars passing by and stuff like that. So get ready. Um, but just a little bit about my setup before we start. Um, how am I gonna see this? Hopefully you, you can all see me. Let me do that spotlight thing again, so we'll zoom in on uh, just these two guys. Okay, so we have just those two images. So I'll start like this and I'll, I'll remove this one so we can see this painting bigger as we go. Okay. <clears throat> so I see the way that I usually work is um, in site size, which is not that important for the demo, but what it is, is as you can see here, we have the canvas just next to the still life setup. And what that kind of does is it allows you to stand away from your setup. So I'm actually standing back here against the wall um, in, for, in my viewing point. And what I'm basically doing is I'm making a, let's see if you can see that, kind of like a frame around what I'm seeing. And all of the proportions kind of translate onto the, onto the canvas. So we can get like the height of the jug in the background. And that goes straight across, you know, and it will be marked here on the canvas. So it's just a nice way of self-correction. Um, this is the method we learned in Italy when I was studying there. Um, so that's the, the way that I normally work with still lives. So when I go outside and paint landscapes, I just you know do everything uh, by comparison. Okay. Um, so the setup here for the, the still life is I have um, one light source coming through the window. Okay. The nice thing about it, we have clear kind of um, cameras are slow, clear light and also a clear shadow as well. Okay. And in painting, that's one of the most important things to do is to have separation between light and shadow. Um, otherwise the image gets a bit messy and hard to, to read and interpret. Okay, so I've just arranged a, a still life here. Um, I tried placing, you know, having a variety of different shapes, having a variety of different sizes, making sure there's contrast, um, and just making sure this looks, looks good to your eye. There's plenty of rules out there, but as long as, you find it interesting, I think it'll work out. Okay, so um, as I start out here this morning, I, I came in and I set up the still life and I set up my easel next to it. And I thought I'd be really smart and actually kind of mark out some of the proportions in charcoal just to get a head start. But then I realized I placed everything way too much to the right. So I'm just gonna wipe that off and just do it again for you. It also just saves time. I find whenever I do a demo, I end up spending 
more than half the time just drawing. I don't get really far in the demo. So um, I guess cheating doesn't pay off. Okay, um, the other object I use, is let's talk about the palette and the brushes real quick, and then we can really get going. Um, so I put up a camera for the palette here, if you can see it, okay. Um, it's just a basic palette. Um, I have a medium cup with linseed oil and turpentine. And I use just about half and half mixture, at least for the beginning of the painting. Um, I just have a titanium white here or lead white, depending on what I'm doing. Um, cadmium light and cadmium medium yellow and yellow ochre, cadmium orange. Um, and this is vermilion red, or it could be cadmium red light. I, I kind of use them interchangeably. And then alizarin and ultramarine blue. Um, this is stalo green, and then um, ferroxide is quidocodone red, which I'm trying out just to kind of replace the alizarin because sometimes I feel that it gets into everything. Um, and I've heard that this is more light fast as well. So uh, I just have it on my palette at the end just to try to eventually incorporate it instead of alizarin. Uh, on the palette, um, I just stopped using black. Um, usually I use it inside for painting indoors. But since I paint landscapes so much, I just kind of gotten rid of it. Um, and the phthalo green, I don't really think of it as a green, but I actually think of it as like a blue green. It's usually outside you mix the sky colors with that one as well. Um, nothing special about the palette, just a wood palette that has tons of oil soaked into it. Um, let's see if this is working out. Yeah. Um, I just use, you know, a range of sizes of brushes. Um, mostly all bristle brushes. I have a couple of these smaller um, sable brushes. That comes up. Uh, and these are just used for fine drawing and, and details and things. Okay. Uh, lastly, I, I have a, a mirror that I use a lot. Okay, this is my drawing helper in a way. Uh, the way I use it is when I stand back in my viewing point against the wall here, I can put it up like this and I can look upside down at both the, the still life and the painting. And I just flick my eyes back and forth and I compare them. And it's like having a fresh eye. Because after about 10 minutes, you stop seeing anything that's wrong with the painting and everything looks perfect. Okay. Um, I think that covers the materials. So what I'm gonna do is here is I'm gonna stand in my viewing spot. Okay. And I'm gonna start drawing out the painting first. Um, just with a brush or two, nothing special. Okay. Again, please ask questions if you want to. If not, I'm just gonna keep, I also have a really bad sense of sarcastic humor, so get ready for that. It will come at some point. Okay, so here I just take, you know, whatever color it could be, red if you want it to be. Uh, but I find that mixing the ultramarine blue and the transparent oxide, it gets kind of like a neutral brown color. And when you add white to it, it becomes a nice gray. And I actually have a few Russian friends that actually paint the entire sky with just the ultramarine blue and the transparent oxide. Okay. Um, and usually what I do is I just, you know, touch the camp, see how much oil and uh, paint I have in the brush. So, you know, if it's really, really runny, I have too much. If it doesn't make a line at all, I can add a little bit more pigment or um, oil and turpentine to it. You know, I, I think that's pretty good. So all we're going to do is pretend this is a charcoal stick and we're just going to go through and try to put down the big shapes of things first. Okay. So this usually goes kind of slow and it's kind of boring. So what I, what I basically do is I start guessing at where the heights of these things are. So right now I'm, I'm just putting like the, the tallest part of the jug and the, the bottom of it, just to kind of place that. Um, I'll also do the uh, 
bottom of these melon slices here too. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm trying to, you know, set, okay, what's the highest part of, where am I, of the painting here? And then all the way down to where the bottom of the uh, melons are. And that just kind of sets up where uh, the objects are going to be on the canvas. And then next you can do our horizontal uh, measurement. Um, when we're doing a measurement in site size, uh, the nice thing is just one to one. So there's no kind of translation. Basically, you stand in your spot and you put your stick out for a paintbrush. Close one eye and whatever comes between the tip of your brush and your finger, uh, you just move that directly to your canvas. And that's what the proportion is, uh, the width portion, which is pretty handy because then you can kind of see how everything fits on the canvas without putting everything down and then pushing it around too much. Okay, so I'm just gonna mark that out here. So that's the edge of the slice and melon over there. Okay, now again, this is just kind of roughing in. That's where the back of the melon is gonna be on that side. And it's gonna look really weird for a few minutes until we start going into drawing out the shapes of each object. Bottom of the mound. Run the job. Okay, so then once I place down, I feel these kind of like, I don't know what you want to call them, just like your maximum distances and stuff. Then I, I stop worrying about measuring or anything else and I just kind of draw for a minute and try to put down any of these kind of like big relations that I see. So the shadow goes all the way until it hits the cutting board. You know, I try to get the angle as close as I can for now, but until I get everything down on the canvas, it's almost pointless to really struggle or worry about things too much. Okay, so just going from one end of the slice to the other one, making that relationship there. Another thing I do a lot when I'm painting is instead of worrying about, you know, what is this object here and what is the other object here, I try looking at the negative space between them. You know, just kind of drawing out you do it here. And there. What is you know kind of space here, the blue background behind it? And that actually helps me get it a bit closer than if I was to think about them individually.
Okay, so I'm just gonna jump around for a second here and kind of simplify everything. I'm not worried at all about um, getting the exact curve of things. It's more just how can I interpret that in the simplest way possible because I'm gonna end up moving everything a million times. So the other thing I do the whole time is I squint my eyes as much as I possibly can. And just helps you kind of see the bigness of everything a bit more. And I also relate things vertically too. So here I was looking at where I place this part of the jug and the end melon, how do they relate to each other? And that would just give me something to start with. It's also a pretty good workout. Based on, like she was constantly going into the gym. I'm just trying to spot where that's going to be, the edge of the cutting board. This is another thing I do a lot, especially with drawing the figure, is trying to follow, mm -hmm. if you follow this inclination, where does that intersect? Up big over there. Um, and if it doesn't do the same thing in your painting as it does in life, then you probably a bit off, you know. So it's just a good way to double check things. Okay, once we get kind of everything placed, we can go back and have a bit of fun with working on the shadow patterns of things. The reason I haven't drawn in the back side of the vase is that when I squint my eye, or sorry, the jug, is when I squint my eyes, they kind of go together into the background. So to me, it's not as important to really um, identify it, but it's always good to put it there. Thank 
Sandra, what are you doing? I see, I see you, not the, not the, I see you, not the, the, the instructor. Hmm? I don't see the instructor, I see Sandra. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh you're missing me, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not now. <laughs> I recognize Rebecca Alex. You were my teacher at CSM. Do you remember me? I do. I remember a lot of you. <laughs> Rebecca, do you remember you, you helped me with a painting that uh, won me Best of Show uh, 1999 over at the, the Coastal Art League? And you didn't you sell that painting for a lot of money? I never sold it. I wouldn't part with it. Okay, okay. It's a, picture, it's a picture of my daughter holding her br little brother up in a river. I don't know it's, if you remember. I do rem I actually remember practically every painting all of my students have done for the last 27 years that I've been teaching. I never <laughs> forgot you. I never forgot uh, you. Thank yeah. you. Well, Joe, Joe was one of my one of my students when he uh, when he went to CSM. I so I've always names. followed his career. I tried to come back to you, but they wouldn't let me take any more classes that you're in your class. Well, nowadays you can audit if you ever, you know, you, you uh, want to go back and you can talk to the um, instructor about possibly auditing classes at CSM. Uh, you know what? I'm 77. I'm not going to slip all that stuff over there. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, but uh, I always think of you, and that painting is a treasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. That means a lot to me. Yeah, you're that a great teacher. really means a lot you're to a me. You're a great teacher. After that, I started using the palette knife a lot, and I enjoyed that a lot, too. I still use it. I remember that. Yeah, you, you were good with the palette knife. Yeah. yeah. So you're still there, right? I am. Can't get yeah. rid of you, can they? Can't get rid of me, and I would hire Joe to teach her in a heartbeat if I could. So, and Ina yeah, I'm, teaches I'm for expensive. us at CSM. Ah. He's too expensive. Yeah, he's too he's too picky. <laughs> you know, I still need lessons. It seems like you always need someone to critique your work. Absolutely, absolutely. I always say that. You you always need a second eye. I have a friend in. Um, Arlington, Massachusetts, and she worked for the for the I guess the Boston Museum of Art for nine years as a curator. And she is a very good friend of mine. And I send her photos of my work when I'm working on it, and she'll crit critique it and say, "Oh, make this lighter, make that darker, make that bluer." <laughs> and you know, she's right. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. That's oh, so good to have a second pair of eyes. It's good for her too, yeah. because uh, it makes her think about things because we're all getting older, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to put myself on mute and turn it back to Joe. Okay, I love what he's doing. Yeah. This, is okay. really good. this is great. So what I what I do here is I, I work in acrylic now. So I actually apply a lot of these methods in oil toward my acrylic work. It's easy. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's the idea is that you learn something and apply it to everything else. Yeah. Well, I don't have a big studio, so I kind of limit what what uh, tools I use so that uh, I can at least paint. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is very okay, so good because this is really good. I just want to add because you're painting white things, white objects, and white I think is often a very difficult subject for many people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's it's nice just for you know contrast. It's also just randomly the only object I had in the studio that looked good with that melon. So. Yeah. No, but white is great because it is one of those colors that you know. You see every color in it if you want to. Uh, everything but white. It's like when I, I usually go once a year to Vermont and paint with a group of guys out there in the snow. Um, 
and it's funny how everyone sees it a different color. Most of the time it's purple or green, but you never just see white. Okay, so all I'm doing now is just kind of rushing through here, um, marking out the uh, shadow edge. Um, again, just using that same um, kind of color mixture. And once I kind of mark out the edge, I just fill it in as quickly as possible so I can start to see you know, the light shape of things. And that should actually, if you squint your eyes, there's no boundary here. It just kind of connects with the background shadow. It's kind of a weird halo. So at this point in the painting too, I already start to think about what my edges are. Okay, so like when I squint my eyes looking at it, I don't see any division through the shadow shapes through here, uh, this to the background. Again, there's uh, almost no contrast. The colors are different, we'll separate it later on. But, uh, visually, we just realize there's no edge there, which is great because then it tells you that this value and that value eventually will be the same. You know? So you can even uh, just lose it completely now. By doing that, you're already starting to organize um, some value relationships in the painting too. And I'll continuously to correct my drawing as I'm going through it. Right now, I'm just kind of um, just trying to get everything down as quickly as possible so we have more time to go through things. See what's on the cutting board there. Usually, when I when I do an actual serious still life for myself, um, you know, I'll do a, a color study for it. And I'll do maybe a drawing in charcoal on the canvas to place everything the way I want it for the composition. Uh, and then I'll go through this stage I'm doing now. But the drawing will be probably be more locked in um, at the beginning rather than being kind of uh, all over the place. But... You also do something like if this whole handle is darker than the background, we can also just do it now. Let's change the color as we go through. The big idea that to gain or to get over this whole thing is just to keep the impression the entire time. Yeah, whatever that means. You know, if there's uh, edges that go together, like there's no edge there, these are really similar in value. So the way your eye sees this is actually from where this has contrast through here to here. And your eye kind of fills in the rest of that. Okay, so let me take just one more minute here. You know, I don't need to fill this up with really any information. Eventually, there'll be a, a plane change where the top of this melon goes up. So maybe it looks a bit wider right now, but once we start dividing this up, it should look a bit closer to what it actually is. Another thing I do sometimes, like when I'm first starting out, if these are in the wrong area, you can actually scratch away. If you a white canvas, 
get the drawing a bit better. Okay. So this is like the the first pass of ridges as far as drawing goes. And again, I would spend a bit more time um, if I had all the time in the world to work on this, but since we have just a couple hours here, I think it's probably better to show you who as far as I can with it. Um, rather than just fuss over one, one part of it. Okay, so once I have the drawing kind of established here, um, I'm gonna go through and start working on, um, as we call blocking the whole painting. So that means going through and looking for um, any big areas of color and value. We're always concerned much more with the value rather than the color. The color you can always correct as you're going along. Um, and if you get the values right, you already look correct even if it's a bit off with the color, okay? Um, so what I'm really looking for is I'm standing back here is I squint my eyes and I just think for maybe one minute without even going to mix any colors. And I ask myself, okay, what is the brightest part of the painting? Uh, squinting my eyes, not focusing on anything in particular, just like maybe even looking, try to look behind it or to the top of it. And the thing that really shines out is the highlight in the fuzz through here. Okay. So you can say, okay, that's the brightest value that I'm going to use. And nothing should get exactly the same as that. Um, and I also try looking for the darkest areas of the painting, which most of the time are in the shadows. Okay. Um, sometimes I also use the mirror and look at it upside down. That kind of helps to do it too. So I, I see one, two, three, three parts in here. Let's see if we can point on the like itself. And I was going to show up. So between these two slices of melon here at the bottom is a quite a dark kind of area. Uh, one up here by the melon, also dark. And then one just under here below the melon there. Okay. So as I'm starting off with my block in the painting, I'm going to establish the darkest areas and the lightest areas um, on my canvas because the whole thing is we want everything to relate as best we can up here. Uh, it doesn't really matter what happens down in your palette too much. Okay. So because I don't have black on my palette, um, the blue and the alizarin, you know, and even just a touch of yellow, so it doesn't go too purple, um, becomes my black. Okay. Um, I don't want this to go everywhere. This should be reserved just for a small piece. Um, Okay, because if I fill this whole area in black, then they've made too much of a black area. And it also, it kind of kills the um, atmospheric quality in the painting as well. It looks a bit kind of flat and cut out. So the reason I do that is I just have it here. I know what that looks like in my palette. And as I'm mixing other colors, I shouldn't make that same color for big areas. Okay. So sometimes I even go through and just, you know, put down a brush stroke and just say, that's what it looks like up there. And as I'm filling in the colors around it, um, I make sure there's a little bit of contrast with it. Okay. Um, but I think what we're going to do is just vary it just a little bit. Okay. So there's a kind of dark red color down through here. Okay. And now we can start delineating the outline of the melon on that side too as we're, draw as we're painting. So The drawing portion of painting never stops. Okay, so once I put down those darker areas, I'm going to start going and filling out first uh, the shadows. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk about the following 
how it moves in the painting because it changes depending on again what color is your canvas the canvas i just took whatever um, was in my dirty medium cup or sorry turpentine container and just wiped over the canvas to make some kind of natural or random off-white color okay so now we can go through and start blocking in the the colors for the shadow so we'll start with the the background there And it was on, on the palette. Can you see that? Yeah. I try not to mix exactly in the same area. So I leave that original dark color by itself and just next to it, I'll mix another color. Uh, and the reason for that is just trying to keep them close to each other on the palette so you can see their contrast on the palette already before mixing it on the canvas. Because again, it's all relative to each other. Whoops. Um, Okay, so we'll start with that guy. And I just use enough medium to kind of get things moving. I try not to overdo it. Um, for the first pass with the paint, I try to keep it somewhat uh, thin, where it's not super heavy. It's just easier to kind of cover up your mistakes after that. I don't really make mistakes, so I don't have to worry about it too much, but I've heard most people make mistakes. That was one of those funny jokes I tell, if you're wondering. And I'm just const constantly squinting my eyes. Okay, like I said before, those two uh, will become the same. So you can even just take that shadow and bring it into the vase or the jug. Okay, and we just switch the color up as we're going uh, into the painting a bit more. But you can just see the values that are going on. Okay, so I'm gonna switch to another brush. And these areas here in the melon, they're a bit, um, the color in there is a bit warmer and it's also a bit cleaner. So uh, I just switched to a different brush to keep that. So every time I put something down, I kind of stand back and ask myself, is this better keep going? Is it bad? Uh, I try to stop and correct it. And because I already scrubbed in, you know, a color or a value for the shadow, you don't have to go and paint it like you're painting in your house. You can leave it a bit open sometimes, which gives the color a chance to kind of uh, jump around a bit and be a bit more interesting. And every time I step back, I should step back all the way and stop, but I'm like I'm contrasting. So again, sometimes people think that like when we're painting the inside of the this kind of shadow shape of the melon, there's a light bouncing condition. So the tendency is to add white. Uh, I will do just to kind of vary out the color a little bit. It's not necessarily to make it a brighter value. 
you know, the, the cadmiums are quite fresh by themselves, or light, sorry. Again, feel free to ask any questions or tell a story. Okay, you can try to switch up the color rank here a little bit before we do that. Let's get the handle of the jug a little bit darker. Also, sending through the a low window in the studio, there's a lot of glare, sometimes, especially if I make a pressure that's vertical. Uh, I don't know how it is for you guys, but sometimes I can't even see it looks lighter than the highlight. So I always have to kind of brush it the opposite way. Okay, so now we'll go into the shadow for this area through here. So we've already kind of established our value for the shadow, but we just make a nicer color for that. So one thing I liked when I was doing the setup is that the melon's kind of reflecting into the jug. Um, so we're getting a lot of fun colors to play with in there. So again, on my palette here is I'm trying to mix something for the, the jug there. I kind of put it inside of that shadow color that I mixed up for the background. And if it's relatively close, then I'm pretty safe. Um, and if it's really far off, there's a lot of contrast, I need to darken it down a little bit more before I play it. Okay. Okay. Can you, excuse me? Yeah. Can, can you speak about the colors that you mixed for the, for the dark of the, of each of them, of uh, the different- oh, The shadows. Uh, yeah, the shadows of the different objects. Sure. What do you mix? Uh, okay, so the honest answer is I usually just mix uh, blue, red, and yellow almost always. And then I can add white to kind of balance things out if I need to. Um, so what I try to do in my mind is actually, I give the area a color. So if I say uh, this area through here, which is kind of ambiguous, when I um, squint my eyes, looking at it, it, to me, it has more of like a reddish, uh, let's see, kind of like a reddish green color to it, which is kind of impossible to do. Um, but then I would say, okay, if it's kind of more of a reddish color, I try to make sure that the mixture that I make has a bit more red in it than the blue and the yellow. Um, so I can try doing that for you here, if, if we can see it. If I mix it over here, is that clear? Yeah. So if I'm making mixing again, like the, this background color, you know, I usually start with with blue, um, a bit of red, and yellow. 
And right now it looks kind of like an orangey kind of color. Okay. Um, if it's so, what I do, end up doing all the time is saying, okay, if it's too orange, what am I going to do? I put a bit more um, of blue and yellow into it, and that'll kind of kill the orangey redness of it and push it more towards um, maybe something that's a bit greener, um, or which should be a bit more neutral. Um, but I know that's really answering your question very clearly or not. But I guess ultimately, what I'm trying to do is like say, and here, this looks orange to me. So I'm going to try to make some kind of orange color that has the correct value. So I, I start with an orange, and then to darken the orange, I usually add blue um, until it gets to something like this. And then if the color starts shifting toward the green, then I just add more red and yellow back into it and darkening it down. I'm going to have to roll and repaint all the shadows again one more time. Um, and I'll try to maybe. Uh, explain the colors that I'm using to, to mix everything. Okay, so now that we've gotten this part of it done, so we've gone through, oh, missed that shadow. Okay, so if we're going to paint the shadow that's coming, the cast shadow here on the tabletop, um, if you look at it, it's it's quite light, kind of transparent looking. Okay, and it kind of has. If I have to give it a color, I think it kind of looks like bluish green, kind of color. So we're going to go for something like that. We'll see what happens. It also is a bit lighter. Orange is one of those colors I added to my palette maybe like a year ago. Um, and it's been really helpful with colors or putting a bit more light into a shadow. So again, there, I think the color was okay, but this divide is a little bit too light, I think. Now I'm making it too dark. Okay, so now that we have our shadows roughly uh, established everywhere, you can go through and start working on the light masses of the display. Okay. Um, so what I need, I need to do again, like I said before, is we will look for the brightest part of the painting, which I think is the highlight here on the jug. Okay. Um, the other thing we can do as well is look for the biggest area of the painting and try to get a color and value for that. So the background is a huge, when I say background, it's everything except for the objects. Uh, it takes up like 40% of the painting. So, or even more than that maybe. So what I'd like to do is try to get the background color in next, which will also help me fix my drawing everywhere around all the objects. Um, and then we'll go through and paint in the objects and then we'll start juggling. Okay, so I'm just gonna put on the highlight um, of the jug to begin with. Okay. okay, when I look at it, the general color is blue in the center of it. So I'm gonna just gonna try to keep the white as high in value as I can, but I would like to add a little bit of color to it. Like a dot of blue. The nice thing about the highlight too is there's lots of different colors going on. They have little yellow flicks going up to the top there and some red and other things. Okay, so that's my highlight. I also just want to look for the portion of the highlight too. So if it comes down a little lower. 
if it has any special shape to it. Okay, so now let's grab another brush or two. And we're gonna start mixing up the background, okay? Um, So I'm going to start with the area um, on this side here, which I think in the computer screen looks a little bit lighter than it actually is. When you're working from life, as soon as you squint your eyes and you stare at the white object, the background actually drops down a bit in its value. So let's start with that. So for that, I see it kind of as a bluish green color. So kind of start out with something that looks like a bluish green color and then add a little bit of red to it to kind of keep it from looking like grass. And every time I step back, I'm just kind of thinking about how those two colors relate. And again, in the background, I'm going to put in kind of thinly because I'm going to end up passing over it one more time. And so once we get something we think works. So another thing I used to do for years, um, especially when I was studying, was to pre-mix everything with the palette knife. So then you wouldn't run out and have to like remix this uh, colors every minute and a half here. Um, but again, since I've been painting outside so much that I've kind of just gotten used to remixing things. And we use enough of the turpentine and oil mixture just to kind of spread out the paint. And again, this would be the, the perfect color yet. But as I start doing this, then all of a sudden the, the objects become a bit clearer. Um, you, know, you can start seeing what you're doing a bit more. You know, as I'm scrubbing this in too, I can let the transparency help me with the values. You know, something's a bit lighter in one area or in the other one. 
you can kind of recreate that just by scrubbing in the paint. And the other side there gets a little bit lighter. Okay, so also I want to make sure that I don't leave any weird halos between these two areas there. Because again, that's going against the, the impression that doesn't happen in nature. So so I really want to do is just kill the, the canvas between those areas. And there's a value change that happens somewhere around here as we come forward in, in space and we start getting closer to the tabletop there. Okay. And it happens somewhere around here. So I'm gonna switch brushes and grab one for the, the front of the table here. I see they're having more of a kind of like a purple color to it. So. I know if anyone has seen this, there's, there was a thing on the internet a while ago about a dress that was two different colors, white being one of them and the other color, uh, I started being blue, but other people are seeing it is being black. It's really cool to refine to see how many people think it's one way or the other. So it's like the tabletop here in the front, in the foreground. You know, I see this as being having like a purple kind of color to it, which partly is from the the temperature of the light. So I'm going to use that as my just general color and kind of push that across the front. Okay. It should be lighter than the, the shadow. Okay. If it's the same value, then the, the color or the, the value of the table is just a little bit too dark then.
Uh, Again, Joe, this is just a, yep. I'm sorry. We are about halfway through. This is Jim. Uh, if you want yep. to take a at some point, that would be great. Yeah, we can take a break now. Too. When, whenever you're ready. Okay, let me just, I'll fill in just a little bit more here and then we can go for a break. Thanks for letting me know. I, sure. I can't multitask too many things. Okay. Okay, then let's take a little break then for five or 10 minutes. I'm just gonna run to the bathroom then. Okay, so we will resume in about five to 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, you wanna come and see what he's been doing? Picture here. Uh, the gal is in the group.
Okay, why don't we get started again? I think before you start painting again, I want to mention sure. that Joe is doing a workshop for us in June, on June 5th and 6th on the weekend, and it'll be from about 10 to 4 or so. And his workshop will be on doing a still life painting, similar to what you're seeing here today, only it'll be in more detail. So just wanted to make sure that uh, you know about that workshop and can sign up for it on our website, societyofwestcoastartists.com. So with that, I think I'll turn it back to you, Joe. Thank you. Yep, looking forward to it. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see here. Ooh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's see, is it going? Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm just looking upside down at the mirror. Uh, I both the left and the painting and just ask myself, how is everything going so far? Um, I try to figure out a way to do this through the camera, but I couldn't figure it out, so. So what I need to do now is going through the painting. Now establish my background. And color value, just kind of roughly. So as I'm proceeding now, uh, I want to paint the things that are furthest away from our impression. So. Let's see. So with that said, if there's anything already that's too light, like right now, I think the contrast between the canvas color uh, and the tabletop here actually work well, but then the top part of the, where am I? It's not showing for you. The top of the cutting board here is actually a slightly darker value than what's here. So as I'm going forward with the painting, um, I would start to mix it and put down a color for the top of this, just so I start to divide the areas up. Um, the side of the slice of melon here is darker um, than what it is right now. So I do that. The <coughs> light part of the melon here is probably really close to the same value that is already on the canvas, so I probably won't touch that for a while. So I think what I'll do is I'll start painting the top of the cutting board to get that closer to the impression. The slice of melon, making the jug a little bit brighter. And eventually coming back to the to the moment. If I could ask people to mute themselves, please, <laughs> unless, they, unless they want to say something. Thank you. Really? Oh, see nothing to unmute myself. Okay, so let's go through it and I'll keep talking as I'm going. So as I start painting in the lights, I also try to keep a brush for each kind of zone 
if I can, if I start using the same brush for one object and the next one, it becomes a big muddy mess at the end. So um, I usually have a handful of brushes by the end. Um, but it also allows me to jump back to any part of the painting that I'm working on and correct the drawing or the color. So what I'm doing now is I, I make something that I think will work. And then I apply it to the canvas and it's like, okay, there's no difference there. So it has to be a little bit darker. Maybe not that dark. Again, I don't want to cover the whole thing up too opaquely. Um, it's just, again, once I get the impression, it's really, well, it's never easy. Um, but it kind of gives me a clear idea of where to head. So again, the faster and simpler I can do that, um, the better. Okay, so like that's probably almost enough for me to move on to something else. So to do that, then I can try to even line up just a little bit that area of the cutting board. <coughs> Remembering that I never want to go as, as light as something else, as, as light as the highlight on there. And this idea of just kind of making sure you get the impression first in the painting, um, it, it just really helps. And it's for almost everything we do, whether it's uh, you know, a portrait or painting a landscape as well. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that for a second. And I'll jump into the melon. So as I'm looking at the side of the melon here, this is going to be just a little bit darker than the tabletop. So again, since I have my palette, since I have the color for the top of the table, I can put a brush stroke next to it, see if I'm getting somewhere close, and ultimately you put it up there and see how you're doing. I need to make enough of it so that it won't Too much tense. <coughs> okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
You also notice that this is also a little bit too contrasty right now with the background. So the next area that I'll jump to and try to get that to go down a little bit more volume. So again, that's just a kind of like a neutral kind of warm. Great color. So, like I said before, I end, I really end up just using red, blue, and yellow constantly. And the only difference is if I need something more chromatic, I'll use more of the cadmium colors. So as I put this down, I just want to make sure that it's close in value. Okay. So if I put that down and it's and I don't see what I'm doing, or that it doesn't make any difference in the canvas, it's probably too light. Okay, so hopefully that I start to separate the side of the melon from the face of it a little bit. Okay. And I just start suggesting it kind of a turn in the form. Okay, so I'm gonna go for the jug next. Okay, so now when I'm mixing this, <clears throat> I wanna mix the value is darker than the highlight. And I'll put it next to the highlight until I get the contrast that I want, and then I'll keep going. Okay. So when I'm mixing a, a color for a very light object, I usually take a bunch of white and put it down first, um, even though I will add blue and red and yellow into it. Um, but at least I'm going down from the white. If you're going up from the, the darker colors, uh, it, it takes an awful lot of white to get there. So it's kind of like a little helpful tip of darkening the white to get to the right value and color that you're looking for. Okay, so as I'm looking there, the the white jug has kind of a almost kind of a purpley tinge to it. So I was going to put down a color next to here and see how that works. Okay. And I think they're a little bit too close in value, so I'll darken down this one again a little bit more. I don't think I got my work, I think. So, so the, the, the white jug is pretty unified. There's not, there are value differences and color differences throughout the whole object. Um, but as it starts to turn down through here is where the value change happens. You know, and then over through here. So this whole area and through that, through there, we can actually kind of paint the same kind of color and value for now. And this will just give us like a, a larger impression of, of the whole painting. And then we can go through and kind of divide areas.
I'm just going to pull this down a little bit lower. And I'm going to cover this up with a different color. But... Okay, and as we come down, it's going to go down a little bit darker and bluer to the bottom here. So again, mixing a color just next to that pile of paint that I just, just made. So here, if I can't really figure out what color I'm going for, I kind of keep it. But if the canvas just looks too orange or green or whatever, I try to adjust it so I'm just talking right now. Because I am also have the influence of the color of the canvas. So if I put down a neutral color against this kind of warmer oak gray color, you can say it'll change how I see that color. So again, until I get the whole surface area covered, I don't really know where I'm going. Sometimes you get lucky though, that's always great. Then you think, you know, then you should definitely quit your day job. That kind of feeling. Okay, so we can get a little bit darker as it goes down. Ultimately, this is gonna to have to be darker than the uh, little slice of melon that's there. Okay, you know, also dark as it comes around the corner here too. Okay, and lastly, before I move on, in this area it actually gets a bit warmer because you're getting a lot of reflection as well from the melon up the side there. Um, so, this is where you start eating up all your brushes. Uh, one thing with the brushes, like, um, I try to use the largest brush I can for the area as well. Um, you know, if it's too small, it takes a long time to fill up the area. Uh, if it's too big, it's too clumsy. Um, but brushes are really versatile, you know, and there's size. We can use something that's, you know, is really wide. Um, how can I go show this? Have something that's really wide, and if you go like that, now you have a brush that's a fraction of the size. You know? So depending on how you apply the paint on the canvas, um, you can do a lot with a big brush. Okay, so I'm just going to make the last value on the jug, and then we can go on. Again, I'm trying to make some kind of uh, warmish gray color. So, and then keeping the value down. So my palette here, like usually, I have everything going from from light to dark going across it, and that keeps me organized a bit. Um, don't have to do it, but you know, just something that helps. So again, I don't want to create a lot of contrast on that edge of the shadow there. Um, so I can even kind of just force things together for now. You can always throw in color if you see it. Um, this one needs a bit orangier. Again, I'm just trying to keep the edges between my uh, shapes of value pretty soft. For now, especially at the beginning. You don't want them to start distracting you. I mean, the the vase or the jug is kind of patchy now, but you know, I almost would rather have it a bit patchy. And I can go back through and kind of you know solidify it later.
Joe, we've lost one of your views. I'm not sure if you can do anything Oops. about it. Which one is that one? Yep, one second. For the plugin, I'm using my phone as a separate. Is it back up there? Yes, it is. That's good. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Just let me know if it goes out again. Just. Okay, so I'm just going to keep pushing through the painting here. We'll jump to the orange colors now. And again, I just put a little note on the canvas there, and then I flip my eyes back and forth. And mine looks a little bit kind of towards the reddish side of the orange, so I can just try to throw some more yellow orange into it and see if that will fix it. But again, it's, it's more about the value and getting something as close as I can for now, and then it's, you know, you can always go back and and fix it as we're going along here. Okay, you can see how these guys kind of meld together through here. So one of the cool parts about painting is just doing that and connecting things together. And again, I don't want this to be such a harsh edge there, so I have to go adjust that.
So they're there, there's kind of miscolored, I don't really know what it is, but just trying something that's different than the outside of it. Um, and it was just a little bit grayer. So I threw the blue and yellow into it. And as I'm going along, I'm realizing this is probably just a little bit too dark there. So we can go back to that color and try to lighten it up a little bit. Okay. Okay, so as I was saying before, like the melon now, the color of the canvas is really similar to what it should be. It just needs to have a little bit more yellow and a little bit lighter. So do that. Well. Usually I have a paper towel next to me here, so if I did my brush too much in the medium, I can just kind of wipe it off. So again, the value should be really similar to the edge of the jug there. They should disappear up into that area. And that's when you know you have the right kind of relationships. So maybe it's a little bit too bright there. I think it's a bit too much yellow now, so I'll kind of just grab some blue and red and adjust that. Okay, and I'm going to take that value and stop it somewhere around here because there is a, a value change through here, which will kind of step you back into the into the shadow. So now I just want to complete the line here really quick before we go on. 
So I'm looking for an inner or a value between this way dark. Something just a little bit darker than what I put down in the light area. Something like that, I think, better. So that's kind of the general kind of gradation value going back to the shadow. Um, you know, as you get better at seeing the shapes of the value, they kind of lock together like a puzzle piece. And you can get a pretty good impression with not having too much, um, too many different values and colors done. Okay. Almost ready for the next next part of the painting here. I just took a value that's kind of in between the shadow and the light here. And just trying to like get those to transition into each other a little bit more so you don't have a really hard edge there. Okay, so now I'm going to slowly start doing this transition back into jumping on the paint again. So now I've kind of masked in okay. so now I've kind of masked in all the general um, figures, the color and value throughout the whole painting, hopefully getting the impression in a good direction. Um, and now what I need to do is go back through the entire painting and start adjusting things. So this is the normal time that I would take uh, a break and go have a coffee, um, put the painting upside down on the easel, um, and then come back afterwards and stand here for another few minutes um, and just see what jumps out to you. Um, the drawing, the, the whole jug is kind of leaning a little bit, so I'll f try to fix that. Um, I think that you know maybe some of the colors throughout here and the melon sizes are a little bit too intense. They actually be lighter in value, but just a little bit more gray in color. Um, and then I can try to improve the sensation of the depth between each object. So when I was setting up the composition, I tried um, consciously not to make anything uh, parallel to the picture. That usually just flattens everything out. So I've made an intention to like angle things going into the painting, um, try to make sure the melon is facing this way. One's going slightly different, a different way. And also the angle of the jug is also facing a different direction too. Um, that all helps with kind of getting depth in the painting. So we have 
a place closest to us and then jumps back into space as it's going. So usually try to look for that as I'm setting up. Okay, so I guess now what I'll do is I'll go back through. Um, I can adjust my value through the background here. Um, and again, this is kind of like a slower um, pass for the painting because now you're going to be a bit more careful with the drawing. This is where you try to get the color closer uh, and the value is more correct. Just a time check, Joe. We have about sure. 50 minutes left. Okay. Let's see how far we can go. If anyone has any questions, I can always try to answer those in the painting if they're a question about on the colors, values, drawing things, procedure. What color do you use for the picture? What color do I use for the picture? Yeah. Uh, what, what part of the picture? Oh my, the whole picture. Oh. Um, the, light, like the, the light colors and the dark colors. Uh, the colors like on the palette, you mean? Yeah, for the picture. No, you have some, you have some. Uh, for the, uh, okay, I understand. I thought, okay. I thought you meant the picture, like the whole picture, the picture. Uh, I mean, um, okay. Because on the East Coast, everyone calls it the, a painting, a picture, you're painting a picture. Um, so for that, I've been using, um, I only have titanium white today. Um, but then I used uh, cadmium yellow. Um, I think I used a little bit of alizarin red and the blue. So I try to stay within that range. If I start adding like, you know, the, um, the yellow ochre that I have, everything is really warm and kind of um, sunburned in a way. Yeah. Um, and I want it to be as kind of clean looking as possible. You know, because if I start putting, you know, a really brown color and then a hot orange color and then a green color, it's just a bit too much. Yeah. Um, so I try to make, I know that the phone on the palette here isn't super helpful. But I just try to make a, a, a neutral color. So again, usually it's adding just a red. Um, if I want to have it be more of a cooler grayish color, then I add the alizarin, the ultramarine blue, um, a bit of the cadmium yellow, mm -hmm. and a lot of white to it. A lot of that top to the white. OK, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And the white usually kind of grays everything else. So if you have a color that's getting too intense, if you put a bit of white into it, it will change the value. So you have to adjust it. Um, but then the color will become you know, more like this, I guess, you know, which is actually a great thing for trying to make things that are more neutral in color. But that's something you can do is you can actually um, put out your colors on your palette one day and you just start mixing them, you know, until you do that, you're not really sure about, you know, what makes what. And every paint you buy from different manufacturers, you know, even they have the same name on the tube, as soon as you squirt them out, you mix them with other colors, they're not exactly the same because they source their pigments from different areas. And now that I think about it, you could actually even paint the, the white jug just using ultramarine and the transparent oxide because it makes a, a gray color and then depending on how much of the transparent red oxide, or the blue you add, it will shift the, the temperature of the color. You know, which is actually a fun thing to go outside and do a landscape painting and you paint just with those two colors. I think Sargent did a lot of that with watercolor stuff. But you can get the impression of, of green just using that reddish brown, orangey color and blue. So. Okay, so I'm just trying to reestablish again the value of the background on this side. Now then going through again with the background, you can start to kind of redefine shapes. You can play with edges as well. If something's really sharp, it'll pull itself closer to you. Uh, and the more diffused it is, it'll actually push away from you. So you know, if you have two edges of the shadow, if one gets a little bit blurrier, that'll kind of go back into space a bit more. Okay. And if you want to pull something out, again, there's contrast too. But the more you kind of sharpen something up and push harder on the brush, it'll pull forward in space.
another thing I do with the color mixing as well is like, so if I have this color in my palette here, which is the background, but I feel like it's getting too blue there. Um, I can just take a bit of red and mix it in like kind of halfway, not all the way. So it kind of pull the red through the paint a bit. And sometimes it helps kind of adjust the, the color of it. Doesn't always work. Okay, so then if, if we have just a few more minutes, I'm just gonna keep jumping through and, and kind of correcting things as I see uh, needed. Uh, there's no real order for doing this. Um, you know, it's, it's basically whatever you're seeing at that moment that could be corrected. You know, the edges are a really fun thing to do. Let's, we spent a long time um, drawing in charcoal at uh, the school that I went to. We spent a whole year, I spent a year and a half losing the par, I guess. But um, we really learned to appreciate values and edges, um, you know, creating this whole realistic thing. Some people are actually really good. They could even get a sense of color through uh, or color value. Or just the charcoal. So again, here I'm just kind of passing over the design of the shadow. I don't know if I can make the edge a bit better um, in areas where I can get a bit lighter. You know, I already have kind of like mother value, mother color. Uh, and I can just go through there and start to lighten it up a little bit for areas that might have some reflective light bouncing back into them. Did lose hit the camera again? Yeah, we we lost your palette. Sorry, just the battery. Okay, so this would be the process, just, you know, again, going back through, adjusting things as you see needed. Um, at some point in the paintings, I actually go back and reestablish those darker marks I made at the very beginning. Because um, as I start to paint, everything gets kind of mixed together. And it also kind of pushes things back a little bit further in space. And kind of help things jump forward again. So here's in the shadow here we have, I forgot to get the knife. Um, 
areas in the shadow of the cutting board versus the cloth in the background there. That can also shift um, colors a little bit. So you can find the right brush again. And as a, a way to uh, delineate the information in the shadows. Uh, let's see if I can do that. It's kind of a way to draw information in the shadows without drawing too much attention to it. Um, if everything is, you can play with colors separating the objects. So, Oh, that's going to show up. But the idea is that if you have an orange color and then a greenish blue color of the same value, they still keep the harmony of having a unified shadow. Uh, but then you can slowly start to define information inside of it. Joe, we're down to about three minutes. So if you can kind of wrap up, that'd be great. Okay, sure. Okay, so usually when I do a demo, I never get all the way through it. Um, you know, hopefully this is enough for you all to see kind of the general process of, of things. And again, from here, it's just kind of going through and correcting, um, adjusting things as much as you feel you need to. Um, and I also almost never paint anything in one session. Sometimes you get lucky and everything works out, but most of the time I spend you know, anywhere from, I think three is a pretty good number. You have a day to start it, a day to kind of think about everything, move everything around, and then a day to you know, kind of finish up whatever you're thinking about. Um, but I spent like three months on paintings, you know, sometimes they're a bit harder. Okay, so I think that's about it for now. Um, if anyone has any questions or wants to chat about anything, I'm, I'm more than happy to. Um, I, I want to thank you, Joe, for giving us a great demo. And um, we know it's not a finished painting, but it certainly came quite a ways along and it looks really good. So thank you. Thank you. And, and I want to, again, say that there will be a workshop that Joe will give us in, in June. So if you're interested in learning more about painting a still life, sign up for the workshop. So thank you, Joe. And um, Happy painting. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I think I'm gonna be leaving. Anybody else have something to say? Okay. okay. So Jim, I can, um, when I stop the video, I can send you a copy of it. If you like through the email. Yeah, thank you. And then we can put it up on our YouTube channel. Okay. And you want to send the link to Sharon. She's the one that'll do it. Okay.
No sweat. I'll do it as soon as it processes. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, you guys. Okay, I'm gonna sign off then. Okay, thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye. -bye.